Thank you so much for joining me for season three of On The Road With. My name is Gareth and I'm your host and this show is dedicated to talking to touring professionals from the entertainment and performing arts industries. We cover all sorts of topics such as the mental health side of being on the road, how they got started and the realities behind being on the road and touring for a living. Don't forget you can catch up on seasons one and two of the show wherever you get your podcast fix and all episodes are also available on my YouTube channel Gareth John Music which is also my handle for all social media accounts. You can also listen to all the commercially available music from seasons one, two and three of the show on the On The Road With Featured Songs playlist on Spotify. Now today's guest is somebody who really is at the top of his game. As a sound engineer, many years experience, he's worked with the likes of Aerosmith, uh, Metallica, Rod Stewart to name a few. It was a really interesting conversation and it was my absolute pleasure to be joined by Mr John Chadwick. John, thanks for doing this. No, no, no worries at all. And as I said before we started the interview, you're one of the guests that I know the least about, really. Um, so, uh, and it's kind of through mutual friends that I just know little bits and bobs. So, for me as well as listeners, um, if you could just give us a sort of career in a nutshell kind of um, summary in terms of touring and you know working as a musician and and uh, both front of house and behind the scenes as as, as well. Uh, I, I kind of fell into being a sound engineer by accident while at university and then through a series of being in the wrong place at the wrong times <laughs> uh, ended up uh, being, being paid to go around the world for people who are much better at singing and playing guitar than I am. And um, just to, uh, to give us a little snapshot, I mean, I know you've worked with some top people. Um, I'm going to ask you to name drop. Go for it. <laughs> who, are some <laughs> of the, uh, who are some of those people you just mentioned? Uh, well, I spent five years uh, working for Aerosmith. Working for, sorry, Aerosmith? Yeah. Okay. Then uh, a year with Ringo Starr and his band. I did David Burns' American Utopia worldwide tour. Did uh, the Anderson, Raven and Wakeman version of Yes for a couple of years. A bit of Evanescence. A lot of Judas Priest, some Anastasia, some more Chiba. Uh, and I've done bits and pieces for... Metallica, Iron Maiden, Rod Stewart. Wow. I was at the Led Zeppelin gig that happened at the O2 many years ago. And, and yeah, just kind of bumbled around doing that, really. Well, we know where we're going, but we don't know where we've been. And we know what we're knowing, but we can't say what we've seen. Thank you.
when you say bumbled around doing that, do, doing what what exactly um, in terms of I'm, sound? Are you, fr- are you front of house? Are you monitors? Or what do you sort of specialise in? I started off as front of house, but ended up moving to monitors. Uh, I guess I ended up working for people that wanted a front of house sound through their monitors. And, uh, right. That, that's essentially what I've kind of got known for. So that's what I've been pigeonholed for. I do occasionally get out the front with, with the punters and, and kind of hang out with them for a bit, but normally I'm I'm hidden away on either stage left or stage right. Get getting a bollocking from the from the artist sometimes I can imagine. There you go. Man. <laughs> I mean, it's um I've I've always thought that's one of the toughest jobs in terms of crew. Um, I guess once you know the artist sounding, you know what they want, and it's not going to change much from night to night. But the you're kind of on the fly. Monitor engineers, I've always thought, have a really tough job. You know, when you go to a festival and there's a house monitor engineer that's got to deal with a million different bands and they have that's hardly good. any time to set stuff up and, you know, um, I should imagine that's quite um, quite exciting but also quite challenging at it, times. It, it's something I try and avoid. I, Do you? I've never been to Glastonbury. I never want to go to Glastonbury. Festivals are, are kind of brings out the worst in everyone. Uh Yeah. It's it's just a hard time, and, it, and if you don't get the sound check, if you're on gear you've never used before, uh, which fortunately I, I tend not to be, but because of the people I work for. Mm. Uh, but it, it's like spinning plates while your hair's on fire and your house is blown up and someone's giving birth next to you. <laughs> that might be the opening quote in the uh, description there, John. I think that's got to that's got to yeah. go in there. Yeah. I always put a little quote from the interview, so I think that one's gonna that one's gonna make the cut definitely. Um, and um, in terms of uh, as a musician, then just the other side, because I actually knew you first as a guitarist uh, with uh, Scaramanga, um, do, doing that uh-huh. so locally. And um, so you you like to get out and play as well, though. You're not you're not one of these who yeah. res- sort of resigned himself if you like to be in a sound engineer. And no, I don't Ooh, want to bother with being a musician. Yeah. It's, it's you know you like to do both still, don't you? I yeah, I wouldn't call myself a guitarist. I, I've I've got some guitars, and I <laughs> and I play them. That's not what I've heard. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm vaguely competent, but it, that's just for fun. There's, there, there's, it's purely for fun and to hang out with people and have a bit of a laugh. Yeah, and I, I mean the that's the one thing I'm missing a lot of the minute. Um, you know, in these circumstances, is just the crack every week, just getting out and whether you're, at, you know, whether it's with the crew or with the band or whoever. Um, especially as you know, you've got the ten o'clock rule and stuff like that. So it's not even like you can get the social side just from going to the pub and socialising. It's um, it's having that crack on the road when you're in a van. And don't get me wrong, there are I'm sure you you've had some te- you know like me, you've had some testing times on the road as well. But the vast majority of it is a great laugh and great fun, and it can be the best job in the world. And and not knowing when that's going to return is quite a tough thing mentally. I think. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is it's more than job. Yeah. It, it it's definitely your life is part of your identity. It's who you are. It's what you do. Yeah. And with that taken away, you kind of feel a little bit useless, really. You know, what, what use are you to people now that you can't do what, what you're quite good at? Yeah. And I think the, I, what, what's really got me, really got me down. And I know it has a few other musicians and, a few, you know, um, crew and people who work in the touring industry is this whole thing about, well, just get another job, just retrain. And it's like, you wouldn't say to a, uh, to a tradesman, you know, a plumber or an electrician. Oh no, you've got to you've got to change your trade now, mate. Just just uh, just training something else. It won't be a problem. It's not as easy as that, is it? Well, no. I, I think what people wrongly assume is that it's uh, it's not really a career. It's not a profession. Mm-hmm. When you, when you work to a certain level for for major artists, it it, it very definitely is a profession and. There's a certain level of income you get used to and a mortgage payment you have to meet. Mm-hmm. And they, they think we push boxes for a living. Yeah. Uh, they don't realise the levels of complexity of things that we're involved in. I mean, ideally, the, the best people to fix things and build hospitals very, very quickly, like all the Nightingale things, would have been a bunch of road crew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, true. We, we build a small city everywhere we go in a day. And then we take that small city down, stick it in trucks. And put it and set it up somewhere else. And set it up somewhere else, along with all the problems that that, that comes with, whether they be electrical, weather, travel, uh, things getting held up in customs, people getting arrested. 
Uh, so generally, we're, we're the best people you, you want to use us in adversity, and we're the first people people turn to for, oh, there's been a terrible disaster, can we have a concert? Mm, mm. And it, it, it's going to be a shock, I think, to a lot of people now that government policy seems to be, well, we'll just let the events industry go to the wall, which is, I think, what they're doing. Uh, it's going to be a shock for some people when it doesn't come back. Yeah. And, you know, it's, can I go and retrain? Yes, I could go and retrain. What would I do that would, that would, uh, you know, keep me in the mortgage payment that I make every month? Uh, I'd have to become an architect or an accountant or a lawyer. That, that's just not something I can retrain for right now. No, no. I mean, no, those professions you just mentioned are equally like, you know, there's qualifications involved, there's experience involved. You don't just walk into them. And um, and I think, like you say, they are. They, yeah, they are. I agree. They are letting the the events industry go to the wall. But I think a lot of the public think, oh well, when this blows over, it will just come back. And uh, even if it does come back, I think it will in some form. But it's still going to take time to recover. Like you know, people talk about six months. I think people think this mini six month lockdown, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, and it, and I know Boris has said today that uh, social distancing will end by October 2021. So you could look at that as maybe a point that gigs could come back. But he, was, you know, he has no grounds for saying that. No, he doesn't. No, no, no. no. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It can be an aim. Fair enough. We'll, we'll we'll aim for that. By which point, you know, most of us won't have worked for 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a bit more serious. It is. It is. Yeah. And I think. Do Do you think there's been much? solidarity among the kind of events industry and the um the performing arts and that you know that a lot of those industries that cross over each other do you think there's been a good coming together and people sort of trying to fight the good fight or do you think people have kind of I, I, think, I think there's a, a one voice as, as there were three campaigns that's now come down to one campaign which is just we make events yeah yeah uh but every time i've seen questions asked of those in power they get they just said well we're doing everything we can for, for people and you know training and well they're not doing everything they can for people they they're doing everything they can for the fishing industry for like brexit yeah that's a massive problem our industry is six times bigger than the fishing industry yeah yeah contribute six times more yet uh people I, th I think because we're hidden from view and people don't understand what we do there's no perceived value attached to it and how uh, and how how do you think that could change? I don't think it can change. I don't think we would want it to change. We we are not the superstars that you come to see. Mm. We enable people to be superstars. Mm. Uh, there's a reason we're not in the foreground, and there's a reason that other people are in the foreground. And it's a, a lot of people I know are, are uncomfortable with kind of selling themselves as a commodity. So that that's just kind of not who we are, really. No, no, you wouldn't go. You wouldn't have gone into the jobs you have if you if you were that way. Um, that's kind of the likes of the likes of us, your singers and your and your performers. We like to be sort of uh, centre of attention, and um, the I guess you guys get your kick out of that. I spoke to a tour manager that I worked with once, and he was saying you get you, the crew get the kick out of that smoothness of the show, it being absolutely seamless. And seeing punters smiling faces as they're leaving, and knowing that you played a part in that, but they don't come up hassling you for an autograph or or anything like that, you know. No, I mean it's there's a certain amount of you only get one chance to do it correctly, mm. and then that moment's gone. Uh, there's a all there's always a massive high from a face in adversity if the equipment's been waylaid and doesn't arrive till six p.m. rather than eight a.m. Mm. And yet you still manage to get the show and that happens. Has, has that happened to you? Oh, yes. Yes. Mate, it sounds times. like multiple times. Yeah. Oh, wow. We, we, we've we had our trucks, two trucks worth of gear. Uh, we're supposed to be going from one city in Colombia to Bogota. They were supposed to be there at 10 a.m. From, from Medellin, which was the previous night show. They arrived at about 8.30 in the evening while the audience was in the venue oh. and we still get the show up and running by 11 p.m wow and that and that's horrible when you're i mean i've I, i've i've seen it slightly from from the end of being on stage doing a sound check but not the equipment arriving not that bad but 
But being on stage doing a sound check while people are walking in is something I absolutely hate. I, I think it just it looks terrible, you know what I mean? And if it can be avoided, it should be. But the actual gear coming through while there's an audience in there, I mean, I bet that was yeah. Stress City, wasn't it? Uh, the, to a point, but there's there's actually, there's not much. It's uh, Although it's out of your control, so you just kind of have to reset and, okay, we'll sit here and twiddle our thumbs and do nothing till it does arrive because whining about it's not going to get it here any quicker. There's someone else's job to go and shout at someone else about that. And do you find... Do you find that in those situations, um, it's very, very stress levels could get high? Um, it sounds like you all kind of deal with it quite um, calmly, really, which is the best way. But have have there ever been? I'm not asking you to name specific instances, but have there ever been uh, times when crew have fallen out and crew generally become quite close, don't they? If they tour with the same band for a long time, have there ever yeah. been where personal relationships have been strained because of these situations that are none of your fault? I mean, it, it can do, but it, there's always a calm head up there who just goes, look, shut up, get on with it. What, the, t- the, tour, the tour manager usually, I guess. Or, or, or someone who's a little bit senior or someone who's been there for a long time and seen a bit more. It, it tends to be the, the lesser experienced people who can panic. Mm. And it, it's panic and pressure where it's not because they're annoyed with someone, they're annoyed at the situation, but they just take it out on someone else because that's someone else. Happens chain to be there chain of time. command kind of thing. Yeah. And and the have you had any uh, have you had any experience like I just said where relationships get really strained and difficult? Have you had that with the the touring artist or band themselves? Because I I know full well musicians can lose their rag when things don't get when things don't run smoothly. Uh, generally, if you've got good tour managers and good artist assistants, they 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 keep them distanced from it and mm. explain before they even arrive what's going on. And some of them. Just okay. We'll we'll get there later. Some can come in screaming and shouting, but they're shouting at the wrong people. And but it, that's why that's why these people get the get the uh, big checks, you know, to to deal with that. There's there, there are certain artists that are notorious for being a yeah. little volatile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you have the good guys in position to to deal with that. And has that has that ever been something that's floated your boat being a tour manager or bit or do it playing that sort of role or is it worst nightmare? No, I, I, I've I, I've not been a tour manager. So I've kind of looked after a production in Japan because uh, our production manager couldn't go with us, and so I they kind of the, the crew elected me, Bobby in charge. Japan's easy because they look after you really well. In it. They do, they, yeah. They re- I was about to say that they really do. I remember the attention to detail with the Japanese um, when you're playing at a venue and you d- like we did one out there. We were, we were doing two nights, and the um, the sound engineer came up at the end and said, uh, as "You know, is everyone happy with the mix? Um, is there anything you'd like me to change for tomorrow?" Um, like everything was that you don't get that level of attention everywhere, and like they were really, really spot on. Um, whether it was a yeah. massive festival or a a uh, 200 capacity club like the the attitude was the same yeah i mean they, they've chilled out a little bit in the last in the last five or six years but i think 15 years or so the first time i went over there we set everything up on the first day we were traveling with backline monitor system front of house mix we were basically using their pa but we brought everything with us who who was this with sorry uh this was with judas priest right and I think the next day we got there on a different stage and everything was already set up when we got there in identical positions to where it had been the day before, yeah. rightly or wrongly. Yeah. It, everything was identical. They, they they tend not to do that so much these days now because... It was a bit more leave, leave it, get on with it sort of thing. It, it, yeah, it's a little more, little more laissez-faire, but yeah, everything is done to the ultimate detail there. It, it, it's, it's a sure of respect. Mm-hmm. And I've and I've found with with the uh, with Japanese audiences as well, and and uh, and the promoters and the venues, they're always really really pleased to be um, to be putting on British acts. There's a big thing for British acts over there, and for British music, you know, the the mod scene is quite big over there. They're into you know, you look at like Fuji Rock where we that we played at. Probably, I might be wrong in saying, but I think there was two thirds of the lineup were British. Like you had the Happy Mondays out there and Royal Blood and um, Motorhead and. You know, or they they had some sort of connection to Britain, and, and Rudimental were out there as well, and uh, a lot more of that than American, really, I would say. And um, that's, I, quite, that's quite interesting. Reason, yeah, for some reason, I think that it's just more authentic. 
Yeah, yeah.
Lockdown. Obviously, I bumped into you in lockdown in the um, okay, uh, yeah. oh, what's the place called? The venue in Loughborough. The, the Cask Bar. Cask Bar, yeah. And um, bumped into you, yeah, and you were doing some filming in there. So, what? Can, tell, tell us a little bit about that because that, that was a weekly thing you were doing, wasn't it, or quite regular? Yeah. Well, well, when I'm at home and I'm not on tour, I come back and I go to my little local pub, which is the Cask Bar. Mm. And on Wednesday nights, they put on a virtual. Well, they put on an open mic. Yeah. We got pretty popular, you know. It's busy from eight till eleven. Oh, oh, it's all live streamed, isn't it? All on on social media. Well, now it, yeah. it, it wasn't. It was a regular open mic at the time, uh, and I, you know, been in there and helped them out with a few little bits, rewired some things, put some presets in their sound desk for them, and mm. so when I'm not there, things things run yeah easily for them. Uh, so when lockdown hit, uh, we. The question was asked: Could we take this to be an online thing? Because it's it's quite a little. It's a pub full of regulars. Yeah, it's, get, sm- it's small, isn't it? As well, small in size. I know his, his capacity has been cut down. Yeah, even pre-lockdown, I think the capacity is only fifty-five. Mm. Uh, so everyone knows everyone in there. So it was felt we needed to do something to keep the community side of it together. And there was a lot of uh, younger people coming through playing their first time ever into a microphone and we, we help them through that. And it's very, it's a very supportive atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got that. I got that when I bust outside, I had a bit, I had a bit of trouble as you might've heard uh, with the, the next door neighbor cafe, cafe, uh, what was it called? Cafe ambiance. Cafe ambiance. Yeah. I- ironically. And, uh, he came out really kicking off asking me to move on and, uh, just standing in front of me, arms crossed, talking to me while I'm singing, which I always think is really rude. And uh, just saying, can you move on, please? Can you move on, please? Like that. And just, I'm calling the police. I said to him, okay, call the police then. And they actually, <laughs> the the guy who owns Caspar said, oh, don't worry about it. It's caused a fallout between me and my neighbour, but I couldn't care less. They they are very supportive. Like they, you know, bringing me a bringing me a beer, 
coffee at the end. You know, they were live streamed. They 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 really wanted it to happen, and they they've got that kind of uh, let's do it kind of attitude, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the uh, we wanted to take it online, but we weren't mm. sure how to do it. So uh, we basically got people to film themselves on the phones, send videos to the cask bar, and I did some research, found out some software we could use, and and the the two uh, there's two kind of partner groups in it, Craig and uh, Rich and Nat, mm. and they rented it from home via Skype. We brought that into a piece of software called OBS, which you can play yeah. videos and, yeah. and stream to Facebook. So I, we, we set them up with that and got them doing that. Then once they were allowed to reopen at the beginning of July, it meant that they didn't have the time to do it because they would be in the bar. So mm. I took it on and started broadcasting it from my house. Uh, but we would go live via Skype to them occasionally to try and do links. Mm. Their internet wasn't very good, it was, so we, we fixed their internet, and eventually now we've moved down to broadcasting it from the bar. So we we go in there at about midday on Wednesday. There's about 25 videos to be shown. We film intros and outros to all the videos, so links. I edit them there and then, and we put the show out at 7.30, uh, every Wednesday, and now, uh, since a little bit of regulation was lifted about five or six weeks ago, we have one live acoustic act on each week as well. What was that? What was that that was lifted then that allowed you to do that? Uh, that, that venues were allowed live live performances. If oh, yeah, of course, yeah, 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 of course. So it does mean losing a table for the cast bar. So their capacity is now down to about eighteen people for an evening. Uh, but they're so keen on having live music. So that then gave me the little headache of how to do something that's live through the PA and bring it into OBS and yeah. send it out to the yeah. which was a little bit of a nightmare to work out. But I actually really enjoy the problem-solving side of it. Well, that's what, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind that's of... Um, actually so... working out how to do this live stream, mm. how to add live acts into it. We're looking to add Aspect Studios into the live stream as well. We've now got the infrastructure for that in place. Whereas if a band are rehearsing at Aspect Studios in Loughborough, we can now send a four camera mix live stream from Aspect Studios to the cask bar and add that in. Oh, cool! Like what you live can... as you go sort of thing to, to the yes. uh, to the program? Yeah, yeah. yeah with only a, a very small delay, rather than running it through Facebook, which is about a forty second delay. That's, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so then we, we have live real-time feedback back to Aspect Studios and they're shown on a projector screen in the bar. So it's basically we've taken the stage from the cask bar or Andy Gursky down at Aspect Studios has taken the stage from the cask bar, put it in his rehearsal studio and you're getting now the feed from the rehearsal studio through the PA and ah, our concert. And, it, and you've got the continuity of look as well if, you, if you've done that with the, taking the stage. Yeah, it's... It, yeah, it's we're right on the cutting edge of what we can do. We're using beta versions of software because obviously it's all got to be done on no budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Free software without paying anyone, and yeah, it's and, a bit of a one band to do it. And and it's a lot of work as well. I mean, you you know, going in there because yeah, you were you were. I mean, and I saw you when we were me and Drew got there about sort of twelve o'clock when we were going busking, and you were there sort of starting up then, and and it goes right through. I presume to. What well, I mean, at the minute it's maybe ten o'clock, or does it? You know, does it go through to eleven? Or I guess you can go a bit later, can't you? Because it's not. It was. It was going from eight till about half past ten. So we were doing a two and a half hour show, and then we'd stop the stream, and the live performer who was in that day got yeah. to play the last half an hour. Yeah. So by which point the bar's full, and everyone stays. But now with the the ten o'clock curfew. We're starting the show at seven thirty, finishing at nine thirty, so everyone can be out by ten. Yeah, I mean it's a, it, it's definitely I've found when trying to book shows recently, and you're trying to look at how to do it, and in my case, how big a band you can take, and um, and how it's going to work tickets wise, and and timings wise, and everything. I can't help feeling that you got your hands tied behind your back a lot of the time in trying to make this stuff work. It's it, it's at the point. I mean, they can't put a band on in the cask bar because the stage isn't big enough to distance everyone two yeah. metres away from each other unless they have to be in a proper bubble. Yeah. And it reduces the capacity so much. 
it's it's pointless doing it. It's not worth it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess what they could do is, um, if again though the weather, you know, with the weather being as it is now, and you know, it was it was a good few weeks ago. I went um, went and bust outside, and the weather was great that day. But they could do something in the street there, couldn't they? Because you've got kind of a few empty shop fronts and things like that. You could put on some street entertainment. Yeah, you know. They asked the local council because I think the government directive was, you know, we need to allow licensing of extra space outside for bars and things but Leftbrook kind of dragged their feet a bit and mm. that's gone which is interesting because when I was busking down by the McDonald's I had the guy who runs the fair down there the fairground ride thing he he, came, he sort of came over and asked for my card and stuff and he was saying I've not, I haven't heard anything from him but he was saying that the council um, are looking for buskers for their market when they put the market on um, to sort of come over and then when, when the guy from Cafe Ambiance did call the police the, uh, I said to him, look, by the time you call them, um, by the time they come, I'm going to be finished. I've only got 20 minutes left. I said, why don't you just, you know, just it's all right. I've only got 20 minutes left. And uh, this community support officer turned up, lo and behold, as I was packing my stuff away. I thought, what a waste of police time. And he came up and I thought he was going to be a job's worth and I, I couldn't have been more wrong. He, he said, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I'll, please come back. Where are you from? I said, Leicester. He said, oh, please come back to Loughborough. We really want buskers in the city. And I have had a few actual paid busking gigs where the shopping centre or the council have paid buskers to come in and, and do that. So maybe street entertainment, I mean, it's it's not necessarily great for the for the likes of you who work on big production stuff, but maybe street entertainment is going to be a bit of a way to go for a while. It, it is, but it, it's papered over the cracks, isn't it? It's, it is. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, it's not, a, it's it's a very temporary fix. It's, at best. Catchphrase, it's not a viable future. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a good, very. That sounded quite government. That did a viable, viable future. Um, so, uh, so that's been that's obviously been quite a big project for you in lockdown. Um, I'm quite intrigued as to what what other guys like yourself do with their time in lockdown. If I'm honest, like us musicians are still. I'm doing this podcasting and I've been writing songs and stuff like that. Bit of teaching, and I'm quite intrigued. Those who work very full time in the in uh, you know as part of a crew and are away a lot, they've got that it's almost nomadic uh, existence where they're touring all the time. What what's been filling the days? Well, I think I think like a lot of people when it initially started, it was like, oh, great, I can paint the shed, I can do the yeah. fence. <laughs> all the stuff I haven't been able to do yeah. during the summer because generally I'm away from you know mid February till. Till December, really, with with you know a few three week breaks or a month off here and there. But when you come back to that, all you want to do is go and see your friends. Yeah. Uh, so you know, doing painting the shed and doing the fence and pulling brambles out of the garden isn't really on your number one list of things to no, do. No, no, no. So yeah, within the first month, I've done all that. So so <laughs> I was very much at a loose end. So the Casper thing came along, and that engaged all my problem solving and yeah it keeps you mentally it, yeah. it, it's signal flow for me i think in signal flow whether it be audio th this is video that's yeah. all so then that ran out and then i found myself you know not really having a reason to get out of bed in the morning so i didn't which i don't think was particularly healthy mm. uh then I, I bought a new audio interface and some software and software that's relevant to what i do normally like uh, effects units and that kind of stuff. So I, I started delving into the world of Universal Audio and their plugins, which I, I used quite extensively on the David Byrne tour. Right. But uh, once they're set, they're kind of set. So this has given me an opportunity to explore them a bit more. So I've been doing that. So I've got a little tiny bit of consultancy work. But, what yeah. what what is that consultancy work for someone like yourself? What what does that sort of entail? Uh, I'm just, it's kind of, I would call it paid helping out. Yeah. So, uh, just, just some, uh, refits for community projects, improving acoustics in. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that kind of stuff. Uh, but other than that, I don't really have that many strings to my bow. I'm, I'm a, I go out and I mix sound. That's what I do. And I can't do it at the minute. And, and, what? and until, until you can get insurance, the key thing is, is once events become insurable again, events will happen. Yeah. Because they can put, they can get, the, 
There will be rapid test machines within the next few months. They're starting to deploy them at Heathrow. The big promoters in the US will not stand by idly. They will deploy rapid test machines at the doors of venues and they will rapid test people as the audience comes in. If they've been tested, there's no need to socially distance. Mm, mm. And that so, means a gig can happen, yeah. yeah. That means a gig can happen. Now, one-offs are all well and good, but that doesn't pay the bills. What you need to be able to do, because a, a one-off show has massive startup costs. So what you need to be able to do is to tour. Mm. So you need to be able to go and do 60, 80, 100, 200 shows with the same production equipment, with the same look in order to get back the investment. Pays it, pays for itself. Yeah. So one-off shows, all we're getting, you've seen the one-off shows that have happened maybe in Norfolk or in, in parks, in places. None of the bands that are on those one-off shows are arena touring acts. They're theatre touring acts. Mm -hmm. it, it's places that would do the Mumford Hall or the Derngate in Northampton. Yeah, or yeah. They're not even up to Hammersmith Apollo no. level because they don't have any startup costs. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they bring back line and that's it. They use whatever lights are there, they use whatever sound gear is there. Mm. A lot of uh, some so, of them, some of them don't even take their own engineer. They, they'll use the in house engineer. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's a win for everyone in that case, but there's, it's just a one off show. It's a one payment. Mm. I, I, you know, I'd need something that's three or four months long. Yeah. Uh, and so do the bands. And mm. because that's how you employ a lot of people. And then there's not, there's, trickle downs to hotels, to airlines, to trucking companies, to bus companies, to the local economy when 10,000 people turn up and all want a beer somewhere before yep. the show yep. or, or all want food before the show. Uh, and that's what you get from choice. So what, once they can get rapid testing sorted out and events become insurable, that's when we'll see the return of touring. Until you can get insurance, nothing will happen. So you don't, you don't think it's dependent on a vaccine then entirely no no if you if you rapid test everyone as they walk up like it, it's the equivalent of going through security at the airport yeah 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 yeah, yeah. which, which you, you do that yeah the venue staff as well if that becomes a reality then we can all go back and they can use it for football stadiums they can use it for everything mm, mm. so you, it's not completely dependent on a vaccine and because how are you going to prove that everyone's Got a vaccine, and there are plenty of people who are anti-vaxxers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think even having a vaccine is the answer. You will still need some sort of testing. What, what one thing you want to pick up on that you that you mentioned there was the, um, and I think it's not being grasped uh, by those the powers that be, is is just the benefit like a one one show, let alone a tour. And that well, one, it is a one-off. It's one payment to the people involved in that show. But like you say, there's trickle down for for hotels, for the truck companies, for the uh, local economy, the bars. I mean, you think whenever you go to a gig, I'm, like I'm thinking, I actually went to a gig on the Sunday before lockdown, the day before the Monday where they said everything's locking down. I went to see Jamie Cullum in uh, in Birmingham, and we went for a meal beforehand. We went for a couple of drinks, and then we went to the show. We probably spent yeah. thirty, forty quid. You know, something like that. We didn't that day, but we normally stay over if we're going over to Birmingham. There's a hotel, um, and it's not so. It's not just the hotels of the people doing the show, a part of the show. All a lot of people travel to see gigs. I see it when I'm doing shows. People, oh, I came from such and such today. They've travelled there. That you know, they probably come through by, by public transport or put fuel in the car. There's massive, massive trickle down. I don't think the wider uh, economic benefit has been talked about really at all, and especially for city city centre-based venues, you know, not mm. so much if you go to the NEC in Birmingham, yeah. you don't go, yeah, yeah. but the places like Manchester Arena, Leeds Arena, Sheffield, Newcastle, Lon I mean, anywhere in London apart from the O2, really, which is all self-contained. Yeah. Anywhere in the UK, the, the, the trickle-down of having 10,000 people turn up for a night is, is enormous. Yeah, yeah. But um, is there an argument, though, that the... The kind of all the because one thing that's become apparent in this podcast is the uh, through doing it for a while now is that all the different layers of touring, and do you not think that um what what well what do you think about the the other levels below that so going right from you go arena like say theatre, 
Um, you get festivals are in there somewhere around that sort of depending on the that that's a very varied. Then you've got grassroots gigging and um, how do you? I mean, they they offer a trickle down as well, don't they? And they also offer a lot of mental health stimulus for not just the people who, who perform, but the, you know your 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 venues, uh, your um, audience, sorry, and and everything else. So I think it's important not to underestimate them as well. And you've been involved I, I, in that in lockdown, you know, with Casper. I, I mean, purely selfishly, I panic slightly over what's going to happen in the next 10 years, even without COVID, because your massive arena stadium acts are now all in their 70s. Yeah, and yeah, who, they are. And yeah. coming up to replace them. You've kind of got Muse and Coldplay and Beyonce, and that's about it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, you two, if they find if they lose the fiver under the sofa, but <laughs> the, the so you need just from that side of it, you need all the grassroots venues because it all pushes up and everyone needs to sing into a microphone for the first time somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I remember seeing Ed Sheeran on TV, I think it was part of the Glastonbury introducing when he yeah. only had one loop pedal that wasn't a spaceship uh, <laughs> and even back then you could say oh yeah he's there's something about him mm. now one of my friends has worked for him for years and years and years yeah and he's his manager and his front of house engineer uh but the, the grassroots stuff exactly as you say for mental stimulation going through this and it, it just feeds everything else it absolutely feeds everything else and it- without it Nothing. We're, we're just going to be left with whatever Simon Cowell decides to do. Well, that's it, and and I think, uh, I think it, I, I was liking it to. I used to work in basketball before I was a musician. I was liking it to basketball. You have a player pathway, so where somebody can start at as a toddler. Um, you know, if you're liking it to music, can start as a toddler banging a tambourine, and they if they wanted, there is a pathway, a clear one. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's clear for them to go right to the very top and become an Ed Sheeran if they wanted to be, or somewhere in between. They could they could be um, not necessarily on stage, but they could be a part of the crew. You know, there there should be a space for those people who don't necessarily want massive fame and they want to just have that solid touring network. I spoke to Ainsley Lister, for example, last week. He's got that solid touring um, network around the uh, around the continent, mainly a little bit in the UK and, so, and some in the States, where he can go and he can always draw a big enough audience to make it work financially. But he's not a megastar. And there's that whole kind of pathway that seems to be getting a little bit... You know, if, somebody, if, if a youngster asks me now, what's the path I should take to go to the very top? I'd probably be struggling to give them a straight answer, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, my, the pathway that I took doesn't exist anymore. What, the pathway of, well, as you put it, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and through the university? The, the pathway of, I, I started dabbling in it while I was at Loughborough University at the Students' Union there, mm. and they had a small PA system of their own that the musicians, I became a member of the Musician Society, could, could borrow for free. And it was to do rehearsals with, and then had a bigger PA system, which was a really good pub system or a whole ball system. Yeah. And so I started dabbling in that side of it because the band I was in and no one knew what to do. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. I kind of liked that kind of thing. That led to every week there was a gig put on at the university for free, which had, you know, at the time, agencies were sending out their bands around universities as a head wetting exercise yeah and occasionally we'd get lucky so we would have david mccall turn up the week before his single was out we had ocean color scene the week before the riverboat song came out right it was, okay. it was that kind of level yeah and so the sound company would come down every week and, and deal with that because it needed to be a bit more professional than a bunch of students who had never seen a mixing desk before mm. trying to Trying to operate it. So I got friendly with them. And then one day when they were stuck for someone, they said, Oh, John kind of knows how our stuff goes together. Let, let's take John. And then from working for them at weekends for, I think it was 50 pounds a gig, I would spend 40 pounds on a rental car. For the yeah. <laughs> pounds on petrol. Yeah. And I'd, I'd break even by the time I got home. Uh, but from doing that, I met someone else who occasionally worked for them when he was back from touring. Met with him. He kept, he kidnapped me and took me out on Judas Priest and Alice Cooper and a few other bits and pieces. And that's where I met someone else that took me 
onto big arena level, stadium level touring. But that pathway of having a couple of years to play with gear at Loughborough University Students' Union doesn't exist anymore. Why, why doesn't it? Because students are now paying so much money for tuition and coming out with so much debt, they only concentrate on their courses. Yeah. There's not a time yeah. given to the extracurricular stuff. Yeah, that's Just true. To get, it didn't really matter if you left when, you know, 25 years ago, if you left with a, a 2 2, a 2 1, or a first, unless you were trying to be a lawyer or mm. a doctor or something like that. Whereas now it's absolutely expected. So that, that pathway seems to have gone. And now it seems to be, well, you pay to go to a further education place that specializes in sound engineering or video production. Or, and then you, you come out of it with a piece of paper that says, I can do this, especially in America. They, they now do university courses on it. They're leaving with $80,000 worth of debt because they've been to this two-year course that teaches them what everything does, but they have no experience of how to deal with an artist or deal with other people on the road which yeah. you or fix things even troubleshooting that kind of stuff and well, they all that's massive they all isn't it they've got this piece of paper mm. that they're right at the front of the queue to go and mix you too yeah doesn't work like that does it no it doesn't it definitely doesn't work like that uh and that's i, I kind of did a talk at one of those places in florida about two years ago and told them that and that their faces were a little bit downtrodden yeah i can imagine well they probably get you know that's part of the marketing of those sort of courses though and selling it to them is that they they probably get fed it not maybe they don't say you're going to be first in line to mix you too but they get fed that kind of dream um it happens over here as well it's not just in the states is it um and it's the same with musicians as well you get a lot of music colleges and what i've found with a lot of musicians out of music colleges fantastic musicians really really good and technically a lot better than me but they that again they don't have that on the road experience the um people skills you need to be part of a, a band um the um the kind of a lot of them are if you're talking purely musically a lot of them are fantastic readers and they know their theory backwards but yeah. are, they, are they they all sound a bit the same they've not got the personality in their playing that comes yeah, you, from you, doing you opposed to by feel yeah exactly exactly and yeah. i think you need i think you need both i think there's merits in both yeah it, it's very similar and you know it, it's a massive benefit if you can find someone who's 10 years older than you who's been doing it for 10 years and yeah. puts their arm you a little bit and teaches you this is why you sleep this way around in the bed on a bus <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah it's how you do your laundry this is how you stay out of the way when the riggers are having ropes in the air and dropping things and it, it's that it's learning how to deal with life as opposed to just how to turn a knob or how to hit a top G. Or... Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're the second sound engineer I've interviewed on this podcast. The other one was Matt Jones from uh, Pick, who works with Pixies. Yeah. I, I listened to that last night. Oh, did you? Oh, cool. Um, and I think his, um, v very much his, uh, his kind of advice to his younger self or, or somebody sort of starting off, uh, in, in this, in this sort of field was just get experience. Don't worry about if you can. Obviously, this is easier said than done. Don't worry about money. It's not money is not going to come straight to you. You're not going to be straight on the top dash. You've got to be that. You've got to be the tea boy for a while. Which it's that old school meritocracy thing. You work hard. You're you're uh, personable. You're easy to work with. You will get places. Yes, I, I know several people who have got jobs because they were likable rather than they were good at what they do. Because mm. you think. Who do I want to be crammed on a bus with for the next four months? Exactly. Do I want to have the absolute boffin next to me? Yeah. Or do I want a guy that's a bit of a laugh and is okay at what he does? Yeah. And yeah. you don't understand. You don't understand that when you're younger, you think, I know all of this. I I I know technically how to do absolutely everything. This isn't right. And then you make the mistake of pointing out to someone that it's not right. And that person doesn't say, Oh, thanks. Say, uh, shut your mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a twat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's. I think that's definitely sound advice. I mean, like Matt was talking as you heard when you listened to it. Matt was talking about when he worked at at Butlins and he had his own little venue there, and they were actually, and he and he had to just learn by doing, learn on the fly, and he made a heck of a lot of mistakes. 
and uh, and he was saying there were some of the most enjoyable days of his of his career. And and when you're in, you're in a safe environment, you can you can make mistakes. Yeah, that was the same for me at the students' union. Yeah, it's a safe yeah. You don't have any financial responsibilities because you're 18 and 19 years old. Yeah. So you you can go and work for 50 quid a day, but what you're getting in life lessons and things to carry on is worth way more mm, than mm. if you were sweeping the floor somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not making a load of money, it's worth going doing because of, of what you learn from it. But the key thing is, is you have to be willing to learn from it. Mm, mm. And you have to take that. You have to kind of. I think you have to very much learn from your mistakes. I've I've seen it a lot with musicians. Some really learn really learn from stuff, and you see them putting it into action in in future. The younger ones, and then others just repeat those same mistakes again and again. And you think, this is why person A will have a a flourishing career in this, and person B won't. You know, I think that it's it's a lot to do with attitude, and attitude attitude and ability need to come together. And if you've got great attitude and you're you've got reasonable ability like you say you know you're, you're probably going to do all right yeah and, and you have to have empathy and you have to be willing to look after each other that's right it's personal skills as well yeah yeah that's right well thank you very much for your time really really appreciate that john and uh, it's good to actually talk at length because of you know obviously i just saw you kind of briefly that time and we've got a lot of mutual friends uh, but i really thank you for coming on the podcast that was an interesting insight no worries good stuff Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Season 3 of On The Road With. My guest was the likeable Mr John Chadwick and it was a really interesting discussion uh, picking someone's brains who's got a lot of experience in the industry about what might happen in the future and other things. Thanks so much, John, for your time. If you like what you're hearing, please do follow, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast fix. There's a whole two seasons you can catch up on as well and there's weekly episodes coming out every Sunday. You can also keep in touch with us via social media. So it's Gareth John Music on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or if you'd like to reach out to me directly, it's GarethRDJohn at gmail.com. If you'd like to suggest any guests, um, any feedback on the episodes, that would be more than welcome. And talking of feedback on the episodes, if you do take uh, two seconds to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be much appreciated. Now, I'm going to play the show out with a song that John picked from um, a band that he's worked with for a large portion of his career. It's Aerosmith with Living on the Edge. And um, I thought I'd play this little clip uh, where John explains why he chose that song. Um, just It just serves as kind of inspiration to those who might be looking to get into the industry to do a job like John's and also people who are in the industry and maybe are feeling a bit down about how things are. This little clip explaining why John picked it, um, it kind of serves as uh, inspiration and motivation, I think. Yeah, and it was, just, it was just one of those weird moments where you think, I remember watching this on MTV when I was 17 and thinking, wow, and mm. now here I am in Brazil in front of 80,000 people and I'm the guy feeding the sound to Steven Tyler's ears. Yeah, that's pretty, I, that's pretty awesome. Dang, dang, is in, it's, in, it's all in control of my fingers. It was just one of those weird moments where you think, this is strange. And John there talking about uh, one of his many amazing experiences with Aerosmith and it just shows what can be achieved if you work hard in this industry and uh, that it will come back. Thanks for listening. Take care now. Bye-bye. There's something wrong with the world today. I don't know what it is. Something's wrong with our eyes. We're seeing things in a different way. God knows it ain't his It sure ain't no surprise Yeah, we're living on the edge We're living on the edge We're living on the edge Wise man